I had to go away because I had to focus on something, and it's sort of like the last book. It, it just it becomes a huge project, much bigger even than I estimated, and uh, I knew it was going to be pretty big. I'm, I'm gonna. I know that you have the camera set up here, but I'm gonna pick up these books first for a second here. So, so my first book I kind of started out small, and this was uh, Synchronized Universe Volume One. And it collects about a dozen different paranormal phenomena that I had already collected good data for at the time I wrote it. And that was kind of a succinct way to write the first part. Um, thank you. <clears throat> I got started on this whole process because I discovered remote viewing in the 1980s. And I was a conventionally educated physicist with dreams of doing unified field theory. But, you know, no one ever told me how the universe really works. And then I began discovering that there are some secrets that they didn't tell us in grad school. And I began discovering remote viewing, for example, which uh, people were able to go into a sealed room and send their mind out and read documents halfway around the world in a safe somewhere, which is completely impossible by our laws of physics. But they were doing it. And that woke me up to the idea that there were some laws of physics that I was missing, okay? And so I've been trying to collect ever since then, what else does the universe do that they didn't tell me about? And so the first volume there was paranormal phenomena, ESP, levitation, things like that, out of body, etc. The second book was an effort to figure out, okay, how does it work? What is the force that's missing that will help us get closer to explaining what goes on in the world. And what I discovered is that what the Chinese call qi, uh, what has been called orgon uh, by Wilhelm Reich, and um, what the Russians call torsion, is one of those missing forces. It's a very important missing force, not in our Western physics. Um, it took me 800 pages <laughs> to, to kind of just describe describe the force and uh, I found the best evidence I could find for it and some, a little bit of the theory um, and so when a Qigong master for example reaches out his hand and causes a dish six feet away to be pulled toward him okay, or, or when there are healers who work routinely in China with patients who are thousands of miles away and the healer works inside a cave and never leaves the cave. Everything comes to him telepathically. All the healing goes out through his special energy. There are people who do this. Um, and so in this country, we've been discovering in the past 20 years how to do some of this energy healing and long distance healing. Um, but still, our Western science is mute about what the force is that makes that possible. So that's what life force is all about. I found out in the middle of writing it that the Russians have already figured this out. And um, so they have some science behind it. That's why I spent a good deal of time trying to decipher. Then after that was finished, um, I thought, okay, well, subtle energy, that's really an important thing. That's what I've been studying, basically, with torsion. Um, what about the soul? Is the soul subtle energy? What is the soul? Um, how, do we, how do we, what goes on after we die? What continues? How is it possible for anything to go on? after the body's dead. And I began investigating that. And each level of more subtle phenomena that you go to, it becomes a little harder because we don't have the technology to measure. We don't know how to measure it. So you have to put more circumstantial evidence into it because you don't have as many hard readings as hard experiments. So it became this book, which is just finished. Uh, it's called Science of the Soul, The Afterlife and the Shift. Uh, I've just gone kind of on on sale tonight. I'll be selling some here. I'm going to take orders for them here. Uh, my website is still being upgraded to include this book. So, um, in fact, I, I put a sign-up sheet around for for membership. Did you see that one? I'm not sure where that is. Yeah, just please, please keep circulating it. And uh, that'll, that'll be a, a little newsletter um, to stay in touch with everyone. And I also have a, a, a sign-up sheet for orders, which you can pass around if you'd like to place orders tonight. Um, the Science of the Soul, 
what, what I found is that the evidence for it is more diffuse. There's more hits with lots of different sources and look at different types of evidence and try to put it all together to see what you come up with. Uh, there is some hard evidence for it, but to me the most convincing thing is that different people's accounts looked at from very different points of view come up with the same picture. So I get correlation about 10 different ways of looking at the afterlife and what's the evidence for it. Um, so that's the essence of this book. And, and there is some theory that comes for those who are scientifically minded and want to get the answer right away. Uh, I think to me the answer is that our present physics tells you the quantum physics has, explains everything. They gotta leave it that way. They know that most people don't know quantum physics. So it's kind of safe for them to say that and they're not gonna be called out for it. But I think the real answer is that our quantum physics is set up so you can't look at nature beyond a certain degree of accuracy. About, about the width of a proton, 10 to the minus 15 meters, that's about as small as most people look. Uh, the energies start to get very large if you try to look at smaller distances than that. So most people just say, well, it, nothing could be going on at the very small scales, and they stop looking. Uh, physicists kind of agree that the smallest distance that makes any sense is about 20 orders of magnitude smaller than that. It's called the Planck length. That's 10 to the minus 35 or 33 meters. It's a very, very tiny. And so you have this huge gap of distances between the atomic scale and this ultimate limit and mostly physicists just say, that's terra incognita. We don't know what's down there, and we don't care, we're not gonna look, and no one can, and, and, and kind of, that's mostly where most physicists believe it. And I think what I'm finding is that that is where the afterlife is. That's where the higher dimensions of consciousness are, the higher planes uh, that you go to when you're not in the physical anymore. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, so let me let me just go through the slideshow a little bit here, and uh, I could just talk all that and go in circles, probably. But I think I'll do this. So that's my background. Um, MIT, Princeton. I I work in Robert Dickey's gravity group there, which is supposed to be examining the great puzzles of the cosmos, you know, galaxies and things like that, and general relativity. Um, I did a few other things after that, but um, like I say, in the mid-80s I discovered remote viewing, and after that I began finding out more and more things that go on that I did not know about. Um, the first book, Simple as Universe. I just have a little quote here from Richard Bartlett, who invented Matrix Energetics, I'll just read this quote since he says nice things about me. <laughs> he says, I'm deeply honored to call this scientific genius, my friend. I never get tired of reading that line. <laughs> I absolutely love this book, it's for the universe, etc., etc. So, uh, my second book, uh, Life Force, Scientific Basics, um, Rustin Roy, who uh, was professor, full professor at Penn State, called it a uh, tour de force, and Elmer Green, who founded ICEAM, said it was one for the ages, so I'll just pass along my good reviews. I won't tell you the bad things. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as you can see, Life Force was a big book, very comprehensive. I tried to pull all the information together that I could find that helped explain this new science. And uh, the same thing is true with the present book, Science of the Soul. It's about as big as uh, Life Force, and about as many references, and about as many pages. And that was not by design. I hope it would be a lot smaller. I apologize for that. But what I found is that um, we're kind of aware today of some of the more modern uh, pictures and stories about the near-death experience and the afterlife. People who have, who have made the news with their, their stories. But we've forgotten about a lot of the old research. Uh, 50 or 75 years ago, there were seances, and all kinds of phenomena were seen and recorded, and very, uh, very gifted and intelligent scientists worked these problems. And we've lost track of some of that information, so I dug it up again and collected it along with the newer stuff uh, in this book. 
Uh, the three books I'll, I'll be making available. Uh, if you want to order them, I can sell them uh, here, or I can just bill you at um, uh, through PayPal afterwards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's um, the website, as I can say, is just, just still in the process of things put together. Um, here's the basic bottom line: there's a lot of information now that we didn't have before. Uh, George Meek, who was one of the premier pioneers in the afterlife, he was an engineer who made money as a businessman, and then he decided at age 60 to retire and spend the rest of his life, 20 or 30 years, investigating the afterlife. He wanted to do it with uh, mechanical and electronic devices. And he said in the last 25 years, mankind has learned more about what happens when we die than was learned in all earlier periods of recorded history. And that's really true. There's a lot of new data which we have. Uh, here are some of the ways that we uh, know about the afterlife. There are near-death experiences where people are clinically dead, declared clinically dead, and they spontaneously revive, or they're brought back with uh, medical techniques, resuscitation. Uh, the out-of-body experiences where people have are able to go out of body uh, intentionally or accidentally. Uh, many researchers who have learned uh, at the Monroe Institute or other places other techniques to go out of body uh, find that they're able to visit some of the subtle realms where spirits live. And they're able to make contact and explore what the afterlife is like. At Monroe Institute, you're taught to uh, make contact with certain levels of consciousness where you can talk to your relatives, uh, where you can visit them, where you can prepare a place for yourself when you pass over, uh, so that the communication is not such a big mystery anymore. In Robert Monroe's books, he talks about visiting uh, these dimensions as well. Electronic voice phenomena, one more technique, uh, where I guess with the advent of modern electronics, even 100 years ago, people began getting strange unexpected signals. So I know I'm blocking, I apologize. I, I haven't managed the invisibility uh, meditation yet, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me, maybe if I sit down, that would be better. But, um, so, electronic like voice phenomena, we'll go into this just a minute, but people began getting voices from people who had passed over. They began leaving short messages on tape recorders and things like that. Um, and that started a whole new era of, era of science. Uh, mediumship, which, uh, of course, uh, Gloria here is a part of that tradition, and I assume you in the audience are too, where people are able to make contact with spirits uh, through uh, telepathic uh, means. You can hear them, speak to them uh, in your mind or uh, some other form. But there's various different types of mediums, and uh, some very valuable information comes from communication through mediums. I'll talk about some of those as well. Uh, hypnotic past life regression. Um, I've studied hypnosis. I've been hypnotized in the past lives. Uh, we have a lot of some really great hypnotherapists. Um, Dolores Cannon, uh, Dr. Michael Newton, who have hypnotized thousands of people into their past lives and um, gotten detailed information about them. So in some cases, they were able to uh, verify that the, that the information was not made up, that they could uh, bring one of Michael Newton's uh, first cases was a man who was suffering from a pain that he um, had gotten in an injury in World War I. And Newton, uh, instead of trying to help the man, he was more interested in finding out what the patch was on his shoulder, what, what unit he belonged to, where he was serving. He got all this detailed information and was able to back it up and verify it, and it, it all matched. So he found out that past life memories uh, have a high level of credibility and genuineness if they're done correctly, if you go deeply enough uh, into them. There's lots of examples of that. Um, automatic writing, uh, early childhood memories that many people have. Uh, many children talk about things they still remember from a previous life when they're two, three, and four years old. Um, and there was over some of those. Uh, and of course, the, the great masters, the adepts, uh, the spiritual masters are able to enter these planes of consciousness at ease, and they have a lot to say also about how the universe works and how these various levels of consciousness are put together. Uh, one of the pieces of my work 
that's both in the first and the second book, and, and a little bit in the third one too, is what I call the synchronized universe model. It's a theory of how to explain these different levels of consciousness and different realities that we encounter. I apologize for not being transparent. I'm really not the problem. Is, just, I'll try to move around a little bit. <laughs> but, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll keep going. <laughs> uh, so, so um, in the synchronous universe model, what I've found out even in the first one is that if you assume that this level of reality that we're so used to here is really just because the particles that are we consider real just happen to be synchronized with each other. So they're all moving in some little small self orbits all the time, very rapid. And they just happen to be aiming in just the right direction so their, so their motions and their interactions synchronize. So they happen to, that one happens to be there at the right point where I happen to see it and we exchange a force and it seems real to us. But the next incident may be somewhere else. But as long as these particles are all synchronized, you'll know, keep seeing the same ones steadily, but we only get little glimpses. <coughs> glimpses are only, only very narrow time slices. And um, I wasn't, I have a little bit to say about this at the end, but the point is that with a picture like that, you can understand how a multiverse can exist. You can have many planes of reality. They're all present at the same time, but one plane is only in contact with other particles in that plane, okay? So, uh, that helps you understand how it's possible uh, for, um, for say, a, a healer who works in South America uh, or, in, or in Brazil to reach his hand into a patient and without cutting the skin, he's able to reach his hand inside and work with the organs, okay? Violating all the physics that we think we know about how atoms should be repelling each other. But if you can change the phases of the interactions, you can turn off that force and make these things happen. So that's just a little piece of, of that model. I'm getting out of phase here. So sacred texts, we have lots of writings, uh, the, Vedic, the Vedas and things like that, that uh, give us some clues about what other dimensions exist in the universe. One of the big puzzles for me in trying to understand the afterlife is religion, because I was raised um, a Methodist in a small town, and you know, each church has its own belief system, but it always troubled me because the beliefs were a little bit different from the folks across the street who were Baptists, and they didn't believe in dancing, and Methodists did, and you know, I kind of wondered, well, how does that work? I mean, does one group go to hell and the others don't? And I couldn't quite understand how, how religion could possibly work where everybody, they couldn't all be right, somebody had to be wrong. Um, and one, one clue that I've come up with for that is that if you look at all religions, there are some core principles that seem to be true in all of them. That there is some kind of universal being, there is the power of prayer, there are various principles that seem to hold true. And so, you start to look at religions like, this is Swami Kriyananda, uh, a student of Yogananda, talking about that science has shown us the universe in a way that makes it possible for us to realize that God cannot be an old man with a long white beard, and his son cannot be just one human being living on this mud ball of a planet. That the infinite truths have to be far greater than we imagine. The whole purpose of life is to understand that we've come from God and that we must go back to Him. And, and I, so that he's getting into some more universal ideas about a religion which I think have truth across the board. And to me, if we're ever going to have consistency between religion and science, uh, there has to be something like this that has to be true. And I think that's what I've been led toward more by my studies as well. Um, so Raymond Moody was one of the first people who began looking at uh, this whole issue of, of death in a systematic way, um, remote by looking at the near-death experience, how people, when they die, if they had been dead for a short amount of time, and they came back, they were reporting 
things to him that were consistent. People from different cultures, different religions, different countries, all had the same series of the events that they experienced. Uh, they uh, felt that they began to die, they felt a great sense of peacefulness, a noise moving down a large tunnel, uh, spirits came to help, uh, they met relatives, uh, there was a being of light they met, uh, etc., etc. These uh, profound changes occurred that were surprisingly consistent from person to person. And he began to realize that there's some kind of system here that he didn't understand that goes beyond our normal science. And when they came back, they often were profoundly different. They had a different way of, of understanding why they were alive. They usually behave with much greater love toward their fellow man. Real changes of personality. Um, so in the near-death experience, it's been around a long time. Hieronymus Bosch painted this picture, uh, which is titled The Empyrean Realm, you know, hundreds of years ago. But this is the same picture that's described by near-death experiencers. Uh, a big picture of tunnel opening up in a blackness. And there's white light at the other end, and if there's a swirl and they led through it, not all of them, but many of them do. There are often angels or loved ones or some other guiding spirits that meet along the way. So this tunnel between dimensions has been around for a long time. Um, Michael Talbot says in NDE, or Near Death Experiencers, universally rep report that they're never judged by the beings of light, but feel only love and acceptance in their presence. The only judgment that ever takes place is self-judgment and arises solely out of the end of years own feelings of guilt and repentance. So this makes it unlike many of the popular religions, but um, it seems to be universally true. Um, Daniel Brinkley, someone I know fairly well, who had three near death experiences, and um, when he, after his either first or second, he sees that he's from South, South Carolina, he would go back to the conservative Christian churches he knew from childhood and go have debates with the preacher <laughs> about heaven and hell, things like that. Um, but um, he, he looked out at the audience in one of the lectures and said, everybody, you are as dead right now as you're ever going to be. <laughs> that kind of brings it home. That, that this life we're in is a, is a form that we're experiencing right now, this physical form. We're here for certain reasons, but our souls keep on going. They are immortal. And that's really the essence of our consciousness. It's learning okay, in different environments. So that's really an important message. Uh, and Harry Holland, another you know, experience there, folks, um, says people will say you're dead, but that's not true. You are the life, and you have left the body. You are not dead your body that's dead. And that starts changing your point of view if this is you know something that people are just uh, thinking about for the first time. So that's Daniel there. Um, and uh, he's been dead for more than 20 minutes and covered with a sheet. And uh, when he came back into his body, he couldn't move because he'd been struck by lightning. Most of his muscles were really uh, damaged. And he could just barely breathe, so he puffed on the sheet. And luckily, an orderly saw the sheep puffing. And, uh, and uh, he was one of Raymond Moody's first uh, clients. But, um, and, and it was it was hard for him because he had been a tough guy. He had been a uh, bully as a child. Uh, he'd been a hitman for the CIA in his teens, go off and kill people in Southeast Asia. And so he wasn't particularly religious, <laughs> and, and yet he ended up in the afterlife, in this beautiful realm with the being of life, uh, despite all that. And uh, when he went back, after these experiences, it changed his mind about what life was like. He went back and apologized to the people he'd hurt. Most of them, of course, were still the same people they'd been before, so they took this opportunity to beat him up, usually. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know, it's really a profound experience. He said that the being of light uh, 
looked like a bag full of diamonds and was not a recognizable figure, but it projected that same universal love. And he had a life review. And in the life review, there were, there were beings there who were communicating with him. Uh, one of the things they did was send these packets of information to him. They're like little videotape cassettes or something. Uh, in this one, he was looking at a scene of a battle in a desert environment. Um, he also was shown Chernobyl, the destruction of the, uh, the, the Russian uh, reactor. This was many, 10 years before it happened. He didn't know what it was. Uh, so he had 117 prophecies like that. He didn't really realize they were prophecies. At the time, there were no subtitles, you know. But, but when he came back, when he came back, he was interviewed by Raymond Moody, and they recorded all of these in detail. Within the next 15 years, every one of them, about 98 percent, had come true. So it kind of says that in the afterlife, there's no time. There's no time. Since the time is totally different than here. Uh, and uh, I'll skip over a couple of these. But uh, Chernobyl did come. To pay. There was one uh, in Bosnia where he saw ladies uh, dressed in Muslim garb with. Uh, black shawls, and he was he was warned that if these events came true, then certain other events would follow. So there was a certain amount of prophecy that came from that. Another uh, example of the near-death experience came from a four-year-old boy named Colton Burpo, who had died or come very close to death in the hospital, and uh, while he was on the table, very close to death, he said angels sang to him, and these pictures were drawn, were done from a movie, done about his experience. Um, this is what he was, while he was having this near-death experience, he went to heaven, that's what he called it, and uh, he met a little girl there, a little bit older than he was, and she knew him, and went up to him, and explained to him that she was his older sister. He didn't know she existed, but um, she didn't have a name because her parents never named her. She died bef before they gave her a name. Uh, well, it's a very, very sweet movie, and uh, the story, of course, is all quite true, because he shocked his parents when he came back and began talking about these things, because his father was a Protestant minister who did not believe in any such thing. And got in real trouble when he began telling his parishioners about his child's experience. They tried to uh, fire him. Um, little Colton also met another man there that was his deceased grandfather. He didn't know that's who the man was. His father tried to figure out later, and when he showed him pictures, Colton said, No, that's not him. Uh, this man was not wearing glasses. It turns out that what he had seen on the other side was his grandfather, but at a much younger age. Okay, about 20 or 30 years younger. And when uh, his father found a younger photograph, then Colton instantly recognized him. And that's one of the universal truths of this of the afterlife, of the astral realm, that we tend to go toward our ideal age. So if we die when we're 70, we sort of revert back to our new 20s or the late 20s. Likewise, if we die when we're very young, then we progress forward into our mid-20s. Um, so this is another little picture. He met Jesus on the other side and described him. He said he was showing his marks on his hands. He didn't know anything about that from church or anything, but this is what he talked about. He said Jesus has a horse. All kinds of little details that we never, never expect. The Jesus he described uh, had a certain appearance that didn't match any of the church pictures that his father showed him. Uh, but then one day there was a CNN program when he was shown the paintings of Akiang from Kramara that had these beautiful pictures she's been doing. She's eight years, eight years old now. She's been painting Chin Chin Chin. She was like four or five. And this was her picture of Jesus, which matched Colton's exactly. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Our body experiences, one more way we have of learning about the afterlife and these other dimensions. Um, 
oftentimes during your death experiences, the first thing people describe is an outer body. They'll find themselves hovering over their physical body. Um, in, they're, they'll be invisible to the doctors, but they can see everything going on in the <coughs> hospital room. Um, and then what that happens next is usually the dimensions start to change, and they may see a tunnel or something else and pull them away into the afterlife and other dimensions. But the, the out-of-body experience has been very valuable in understanding uh, the afterlife because people are able to reproduce it. You can do it while you're alive and healthy. You can go out of body as often as you want to. Uh, Charles Hart, a researcher, said that thousands, if not millions of people alive today have had the experience of existing outside the space of their physical bodies for a brief period. Uh, when it changes your understanding, they say, I no longer believe I have a soul or some part of me that will survive death. Now I know it. So they show that we can exist without our body. That's what we can show from that. And uh, our laws of physics, of course, have no way to explain how that's possible. Um, oftentimes, at the moment of death, um, hospice workers or nurses see a globe of energy, a ball of gold or white light leaving the body. Here's a photograph or a caption. Um, people who are adept at altered states describe out-of-body experiences that happen every night. When we sleep, when we dream, uh, a part of us goes out of body and hovers above the physical body. Uh, sometimes this is a way of pulling in subtle energy. We can collect subtle energy from the universe better through the astral body and then it feeds down through the silver cord into the physical body and gives us a, a good rest. But oftentimes, people also go traveling and you can visit other people. I've been, I've been told a couple times that I was out of body and visited people. I had no recollection of it. But uh, many people are able to do it quite consciously. Uh, this is one of the keys also in the military remote viewing program that they would go out of body and go visit some target that they were supposed to be examining. So it's, it's well known and been known for thousands of years. Uh, Plato wrote about it. Other ancient Greeks knew about it. Um, when we are out of body, there, there's sort of two different forms that are important. One is something that kind of looks like the shape of our body that's often seen, but then another form which is an orb, a small sphere, one inch in diameter or thereabouts. Um, and many people photograph these things. Now it's true that you can photograph orbs can be fake orbs because any, any camera with a flash near the lens, if you photograph a piece of dust or an insect or a drop of water, it'll blur it because it'll be out of focus and it'll look like a little round sphere. So lots of people get orbs that aren't conscious, but there are also real conscious orbs and we have lots of examples of that. Uh, one of them is, is with uh, Chris Moon, who's a ghost, ghost hunter here in Colorado, um, went to a house he grew up in, and there were orbs living in the basement. They would come and visit at certain times of day. Hundreds of them come out of a certain portal in the basement, and then they would fly around in the room. And it's best, night shot infrared photography is a very good way to look at these. Uh, he was able to, to see them, they were flitting across rapidly in the darkness. And he was watching them. I had my own little night shot video camera, but my eyes weren't as quick as his. So he would keep reporting when he saw one, and I didn't see anything. So he speaks into the darkness of the basement and said, will, will an orb please appear for Claude's camera and then move slowly so he can photograph you? <laughs> and in about one or two seconds, an orb popped in right there and began moving slowly toward me. So it took about seven or eight frames to reach this point here. So it was very cooperative. So, so we have lots of examples like that. We know that some orbs are conscious. Uh, Sylvia Brown, who's a well-known um, uh, psychic, when she was a seven-year-old girl, was brushing her hair 
in front of the mirror, and a little orb appeared up the virtual way and began speaking this little high pitched voice. And she kind of got scared, but she had that, that young seven year old hearing, she could hear it, and she told her mother about it. And her mother, her mother also was a psychic and said, Well, honey, don't be scared. That was just your grandmother. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and and since then I've found many other accounts of people when they are in the afterlife and they're allowed to come back and visit us in the physical, they often come back in the form of an orb. And uh, they are looking out of the orb like being inside of a soap bubble, like something that you saw in the Wizard of Oz, you know. And uh, this seems to be the, the, the form that allows them to make that connection to the dimensions. Uh, OBD experiments, lots of people are very good at this. Uh, this is a case that was published uh, years ago. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Landau, he, he, his wife, uh, tended to go out of body at night while sleeping quite frequently. And he could watch her from his bed here, and they, they designed an experiment where when she had her OBE at night, she'd get up and pick up an address book of his and bring it across the hallway and drop it in his bedroom. Uh, well, he woke up in the middle of the night and to see her semi-transparent form sliding backwards out of his room, back to her bedroom. When he got up and, and he asked her, what happened? You didn't bring my address book. And she said, well, I tried to pick it up and my hand went through it because I've been told all my life not to pick up other people's things. <laughs> and so she looked around the room and picked up a small toy dog that was over in her room and brought that instead and left that beside his bed. And then he woke up as she was slowly leaving. So this type of thing does happen. And um, other kinds of out-of-body experiments experiments have been done that prove this stuff is real. Um, the Chinese began doing it with remote viewers and uh, Chinese characters. They brought a Chinese character, you know, at large, in an envelope, and seal it next to a piece of x-ray film. And uh, then they would, have it, and they would ask a remote viewer in some other room, go out of body, and go look inside that envelope and tell us what you see, with Chinese character. And uh, these guys were pretty good. They could have a pretty good accuracy at being able to see the character, but they discovered that whenever they were able to see the character, they also caused the actual film to be exposed. So they got an imprint of the, of the film, which means some kind of energy in their OBE, energy in their OBE body caused the film to be exposed. So Hal Putoff and some other scientists in America tried to reproduce this in a photovoltaic tube and reasoned that the, out of the astral body is uh, producing a light that is generating the film, causing the film to be exposed. So they put a little tube here with the target here, and then their remote viewer would try to go look at the target, and they would look for pulses on the photovoltaic tube. They would see more pulses when they were getting hits. And this is an example of their data. It wasn't quite as good as the Chinese data, but they still got enough hits to know that they were getting a real effect. So the astral body was generating a light or something. Most likely what it was doing was causing the photovoltaic tube to give a signal because it was affecting the electronics in the tube. But they could measure it, that's the real point. Another example here is the Osis Tannhaus. Carlos Osis was a, was a scientist. Uh, Tannhaus, a psychic, very adept in that body. He was in one bedroom wired with all kinds of electrodes and things to monitor his body. In a distant room in the laboratory was another uh, device, a little box suspended from the ceiling by a cord, by elastic cords, and a device that was changing uh, little uh, mechanically uh, devices inside the box so the image would keep changing. And um, Tannhaus's instructions were to go to a certain place place here on this box and look and tell us what image you see because the image would keep changing. What Osis found is, and the, but the box was bootstrapped. The box had uh, strain gauges, it had aluminum foil, the strain gauges, it had optical sensors and magnetic sensors, all kinds of things to detect if anything unusual was happening inside the box. And what Osis found is that when Tannhaus was able to see 
correctly the image over here, he was setting off these sensors. His astral body was triggering them, so it means that he was generating electrical and optical disturbances. So this is so that so our beginning, just beginning our, our research into what the soul is, what these energy bodies are, and how they move. Um, Keith Harari, another person very adept at going out of body, uh, when he went to visit his, his doctor, uh, he was witnessed there as a small red orb zipping around in the doctor's office. Here's a photograph of a lady, brilliant photograph. She's standing on a platform that's generating high voltage electrical fields at various frequencies. And uh, the time lapse camera, they found that when she goes out of body, which she was very good at doing, they found this surprising energy blob over here to the side as she appears to be partially out of body. And her chakras also were displaced in the process. So it's a very interesting uh, indication that this stuff can be measured. Um, sometimes it happens without your intention. It happens purely by accident. And that's probably maybe the most frequent way. In this case here, uh, a lady was, uh, and her daughter was driven into her state and just had a baby, a new baby. The mother wanted to go visit but had not gone yet. So she's fixing supper and thinking about her daughter. Um, waiting for my husband to come home, I went in and lay down on the bed. Still had on my apron for, from the kitchen. I dropped into a semi-conscious state, and suddenly I was standing in my daughter's home in Oregon. Her husband was home from work and was holding and talking to the baby. Suddenly they both looked up and saw me standing at the door. They were very surprised. <laughs> and their surprise, I guess, startled me back into my body, back to where I was in California. A few minutes later, the phone rang. My daughter was wanting to know where I was. And was I all right? They thought I was dead. They'd seen me in Oregon. The funny part was, they didn't see me with my apron. They saw me in my best dress, the one I had just bought and was planning to wear when I went to see her in Oregon. It's, it seemed I just put on and went. So, and, and this is surprisingly typical, even though it's an amazing story, it's surprisingly typical of OBE cases, uh, where uh, we are often seen as a full three-dimensional body. Uh, however, uh, I know a ghost hunter in, in Virginia who has studied thousands of these cases, and whenever he photographs what he thinks is going to be a full-bodied apparition, all he gets are the little orbs. So it seems like the orb is somehow a more central, important piece of the projection in the three-dimensional body. It might be something that the orb projects to make it appear as a body. That's just a hypothesis, but um, it happens a lot in that way. So the soul body um, may carry with it the template for the physical body. And it projects it during the OBE. That's my hypothesis. I'm trying to develop a science for all this stuff. Um, so the OBE show us that we are more than our physical bodies. Our consciousness exists in higher dimensions and continues beyond physical death. Uh, mediums are another wonderful window into these dimensions of the afterlife. We need for people, oftentimes, who are able to communicate with the other side in different ways. The telepathic media of the kind you see most often um, in the public media, but from the automatic writing is another way we communicate with the dead. Uh, physical mediums in a different way and direct voice. And I'll explain those here. The telepathic mediums like John Edward, Alison and Blah, they communicate with spirits telepathically and relay the message to us. Some people aren't satisfied with that because the gun opened itself up to fraud. If the telephone like medium is pretending, how do you know? How do you check? Um, well, luckily, people have begun checking. And this is in Gary Schwartz's work where he will take people who claim to be mediums and will have them try to communicate with the spirit and then score them and not allow them 
to see the person that are interacting with the physical sitter who is a representative. They can't see that person. They can't, they can't get a clue. They can't, they can't do what's called cold reading, looking at the reaction of the person to gauge whether they're right or wrong. They have to do it all blind. And what he found is that the real mediums, here's the control down here at 40%, but the real good mediums are up here at 80 or 90% accuracy. So it is a real phenomenon that the good ones score consistently high. And um, this is one example of a real telepathic medium. Albert Best was kind of famous in England uh, as being a good medium. And uh, there was a minister in the uh, Church of Scotland. David Kennedy, whose wife had just died, and he was deeply bereaved, but didn't really believe that life could possibly continue after him, didn't think he could possibly communicate with her. But one day, out of frustration, he said, come on, Anne, give me a sign, something that no one could possibly know. And then he fell asleep on the sofa. Deeply sad and worried about the sermon, he had to prepare for the service later in the day. He suddenly woke up and realized he overslept. He only had five minutes to prepare his sermon and find his minister's collar. Frantically, he searched the house and could not find his old notes or a clean collar. At that moment, the phone started ringing and he was too rushed to answer it. It continued to ring and ring. At length, he picked up the receiver and said angrily, Can I help you? The voice on the other end of the phone said, Your wife Anne is with, with, with me. He tells me that your clean collars are at the bottom drawer of your wardrobe, and the speech you prepared last year for this service is in the top drawer of your desk. Incidentally, my name is Albert Best. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and this began a long communication between the Reverend and his deceased wife. Uh, he would keep talking, he would ask her questions in an empty room, and then Best would ring up. And, and bring, bring the answers. But after a while, Best called up and said, would you please stop telling your wife to stop doing me calling me. It's, she's not giving me any rest at all. She calls me all hours of day and night. Just kind of leave me alone. You know? but, um, but the stuff, the stuff is very real if the mediums are good. Um, some of our best information about the afterlife comes from some of these highly rated mediums. Uh, Margaret Gravel, uh, was a very highly rated medium in England. Uh, she had helped uh, Marshal uh, Lord Dowding in the Battle of Britain uh, locate downed flyers. The flyers could be either dead or alive, but her mediumship skills allowed her to help him locate where they were. They would go and do rescues of them. Uh, so uh, one, a member of the, of the Matson family, he's a reverend, uh, not to, not to know her because uh, Madsen was getting up in years. And his wife had died before, and Flavelle had been helpful with them. So when he passed away, they asked her to begin trying to communicate with him. And she began making notes on what he was telling her, and it became a very long book. It was one of the best books about the afterlife, Witness from Beyond. He goes on the details about his accounts of what he experienced in the afterlife. Uh, another uh, medium is Anthony Borgia, uh, who has lengthy accounts from Monsignor Robert Hugh Benson, whose uh, father was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, and uh, he also, and he was also a theologian himself, so uh, Benson was, he was kind of, had some psychic ability. So he communicated with some spirits himself, even though he knew that he wasn't supposed to, according to the beliefs of his church. But he was really curious how much of his doctrine that he'd been telling all of his parishioners was true and, and wrong. And so when he died, he began communicating back to Borja and explaining to him which parts were right, which parts were wrong, and correct his record after the fact. So both of these books are really delightful books with lots of detail about what it's like on the other side. And uh, for me, as a scientist, I really want to compare all of these different accounts. We have probably thousands of accounts of what the afterlife is like from many different <coughs> media communication and different kinds of people. 
And so in one of the chapters of my book, I try to compare a lot of their stories to see what seems to remain true. And it's surprising how much is consistent. Um, so so they, they, they describe most of these descriptions are what we call the astral dimension. It's the first level we find ourselves in after death. And there are several levels in that plane. Um, but that's where most of us humans are headed when we die. That it reflects our level of consciousness here on the Earth. The Earth is sometimes called an astral planet because most of the people here are kind of working on the astral levels of consciousness. So we kind of recycle between the astral plane and the Earth plane until we advance further and move up to the higher planes. Um, but they have you know, buildings and landscapes and organizations and water and flowers and dwellings and libraries and all kinds of things. Lots of details about the afterlife. Another way we know about the afterlife is through physical mediums. These are people who are able to actually manifest physically certain things that show us the reality of the afterlife. And it all depends on a special material called ectoplasm. And that is something that most scientists are pretty skeptical of today. Because we went through a period in the 30s and 40s when there were some hoaxes that occurred, and the, the newspapers tended to really love to play up the hoaxes. And you don't hear much about the positive examples. And so I was very skeptical about ectoplasm when I first heard of it. But it's a, it's a substance that's part physical and part spiritual. And that means it's a way to actually show spiritual phenomena uh, on the physical plane. Uh, Nobel laureate uh, Charles Richet conducted ex extensive experiments in the 20s and 30s on this uh, Nobel laureate in medicine. And he says, when I recall the precautions all of us have taken, not once, but 20, 100, even a thousand times, it's inconceivable that we should have been deceived on all those occasions. Sometimes these exercises can be seen in the process of organization. I've seen an almost rectilinear prolongation emerge from Eusapia Palladino's body, which is a medium, uh, in, ter in termination acting like a living hand. In other words, this stuff exudes from the body, from certain organs and certain orifices in the body, and it comes out as a stream, but then the end of it can be animated. You can have a shape of a hand or a face, things like that. Uh, he says, I've been able to see the first lineaments of materialization as they were formed. I have another account, a little while later, of a man who, uh, whose mother ran what's called the Home Circle. It was a seance uh, in England. And he would often watch when this ectoplasm would come out of his mother, pile up on the floor as this white mass. And as he's watching it, it starts to rise up. And that this figure starts to emerge from, from it. The spirit has entered the mass and is kind of covering itself with the mass. And as it does so, the spirit's body becomes visible. So when you see, and, and when they disappear, when they leave, they do the same thing. This full three-dimensional, full height being will kind of collapse back down like the, like the witch in the Wizard of Oz back in, in this little puddle of, uh, of stuff on the floor and then disappear. So it's, a, it's an amazing phenomenon. And when you see it, it doesn't leave much doubt. Um, in the old days, when Richet was operating back in the 20s, um, it was hard to see um, these phenomena because ectoplasm is very sensitive to light. Uh, it's, a, it's a mixture of very delicate energies, but now with infrared photography, we have very good imagery of the whole process as it occurs. Uh, here is uh, media mm -hmm. Mindy Harrison uh, in relaxing the trance state. This stuff is exuding from her face, mouth, and other parts of the body. And it kind of looks like a cloth, like a, like a muslin or something. But it's often flexible. It, it moves on its own and appears that the other spirits, their spirits are helpers who help in this process. They may pull it or help to shape it. Um, here's another one, uh, the Johannesburg medium. Um, it comes from his mouth also. I knew a physicist 
our friend who happened to have been working in South Africa for a while and got to see uh, some of these mediums and took an interest in this because he was a materials scientist and he knew he was seeing a material here that he couldn't explain. Um, but, uh, I have a theory for what's going on when this is happening. And this is based on the torsion energy that I described in volume two, that the torsion who exists as little fibers of, of which are twisting regions of space. And these little fibers they tend to twist around each other, and therefore they can twist into, I believe, a string, a region of torsion that's stronger, that acts more like a thread, but it's a thread of space-time, so it's not a physical uh, distortion, it still has a <coughs> force. Um, and what I think it does is these little threads interact with uh, cells and physical, physical cells, liquid, things like that, and can tie them together in the filament, which is a mixture of the torsion, which is a non-physical energy, with the cells, which are physical. And there, because one of the things that they say about ectoplasm is it tends to have a thread-like character to it. Very often, that's one of the most uh, salient characteristics of it. So this model may be an explanation for what ectoplasm is. Um, so, uh, almost a century ago, it was a time of great activity where good scientists, world-class scientists, investigating this stuff. Nowadays, you don't hear much about it. But uh, I have a book by Gilles who does experiments with ectoplasm. Um, he says again here that it may take on a likeness of more or less visible filaments, giving the other customer observer the impression of threads intended to move an object fraudulently. At other times, it assumes the appearance of light woven stuff like muslin. And uh, the photography shows this web. So here's, here's Mache basically saying the obvious with anybody. If we were involved in this research, we'd say the same thing. Then I shall not waste time in stating the absurdities. Almost the impossibilities from a psychophysiological point of view of this phenomenon. A living being or living matter formed under our eyes, which has its proper warmth, apparently a circulation of blood, and a physiological respiration, which is also a kind of psychic personality, having a will distinct from the will of the medium, in a word, a new human being. This is sure the climax of marvels, nevertheless, it is a fact. And this is the kind of thing that happens in these physical seances. Um, this is one of them, the home circle, this is one of the uh, figures that materialized. They very often cover their body, and most of their body, with this muslin, which is produced from the ectoplasm, because of this fibrous quality. They can weave it, the spirits can weave it in the form of form, woven fabrics, very little energy. So they prefer to do that. They only cover parts of the body, just enough face and hands, so you can understand who they are. But, uh, here's another one that uh, we realize quite frequently in the home circle. Uh, this is Aunt Ag. She was the old, she was the, the, the elder sister of the medium, uh, Minnie Harrison. She died about four years earlier, and she would often materialize. And this is a man who's at the, at the uh, seance, but she would come out here, walk out into the crowd of people, she'd shake hands with people, talk to them, things like that. I have uh, one uh, paragraph in the description of a lady who was so scared when she came to the seance for the first time, she was going to be a dead person, oh my God. You know. But this lady was so lifelike, and so ordinary and friendly, and would walk out at you know, four feet tall, and, a little thing, but she's you know, just full of life, and it made it very clear that when we are supposedly dead, you know, our bodies have died, and yet our life, our character, our personality, our consciousness is still just as alive as it was before. That all of the stories about what goes on in the afterlife make it very clear that life continues there 
very much as it does here. Um, there's also one other aspect of ectoplasm, which is important, that uh, some mediums uh, use it to form a voice box, uh, which attaches to the medium, but the spirits can use it to speak through it and generate sound. And um, that's called direct voice. There aren't very many mediums who can do this, but when they can, the results are startling and very convincing to even the, the hardest skeptic. Um, and uh, there are two uh, such mediums, the Johannesburg medium on the right and uh, Jack Weber on the left. And you can see in both cases this ectoplasm is coming out of their nose and forming into a, a, a sac or a container. And this will vibrate and generate the sound. Uh, one of the most famous mediums of uh, Leslie Flint, who was seen here with his voice box uh, forming. One of the great things about Leslie Flint is that he was lived in England and he had a couple who were very devoted to recording all of the seances. So we have hundreds and hundreds of these seances where he will be sitting in a chair like this at a meeting and the voices of various spirits have come to visit and to speak through his voice box. And when they do, they produce their own characteristic sound. Each voice sounds a little bit different. The pitches, uh, the accents, even the language. Oftentimes they speak in languages that are quite obscure to Flint, but they would be characteristic of that particular person when they come through. I uh, the scientists did many experiments with him. They would fill his mouth with a pink liquid and put a pet tape a bandage over his mouth so he couldn't speak or do any kind of fakery or anything. Uh, tie his arms and legs to the chair and make it sit like that. And the voices would appear just as before. The voices often appeared in the air around him. Around him. And uh, they were often loud enough so you could record them without any amplification or help at all. Um, so we have hundreds of these recordings from Leslie Flint's uh, experiences that are on uh, a website that's in, represent in my book. I got permission to use, to liberally quote from it. Um, and here's Flint saying, I do my work by sitting wide awake in total darkness with other people. I'm a medium. I have the rare gift known as independent direct voice. The voices of the dead speak directly to their friends or relatives and are working in the space a little above my head and slightly to one side of me. They are objective voices which my sitters can record on their own tape recorders to play later in the privacy of their own homes. And uh, they are, what's, what's amazing when I'm looking at these things is the variety of the voices. They often speak 10, 20 different languages uh, the, 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 the mediums typically only know one, one, one language, uh, but they have their own accent and knowledge is very unusual and specific to that particular spirit. Uh, in Leslie Flint's case, uh, one of the messages came through from a person who had been a member of his uh, circle uh, before passing away. Uh, Mr. Olson, who's friends with some members of the group. And as they're recording it, he's talking to them, and he's saying, I wouldn't come back to the physical if you offered me all gold in China. I'm perfectly well, I'm perfectly happy, and I can't tell you how marvelous it is to be dead. <laughs> and uh, here's one of my man, Mr. Biggs, who's describing what it was like when he died. Uh, anyway, the doctor went and then they came. They took my body away. He died in his home, took my body away, they slumped it down like an old sack of potatoes, and I thought, I'm not going after him, because he's out of body now, so he's watching this whole thing in the out of body form as they carry his dead body away. I'm not going after them, I'm going to stay here in my own home, I might as well sit down in my chair now that it's empty. <laughs> so I sat down there and I tried to think it all out. You know? Anyway, my sister by this time, She'd gone off, and I was alone in my house again. And all of a sudden, it was just as if the fireplace disappeared. It's the only way I can put it. And there, where the fireplace was, 
It was as if the wall had disappeared and I could see beautiful green fields and trees and a little sort of well. I was going to say it was a river, but it was more like a little brook. And what he's describing here is the way that, that when we die, what we are aware of changes. Well, our, our frequencies change, the phases change. So it's like the synchronized universe model that I was describing before. What we are aware of depends upon the frequencies that we're linked to, the particles we're linked to. And if they change, then now we're synchronized with something else. And typically that's what is described over and over again in these uh, afterlife cases, that the other uh, various planes of the afterlife behave just like the synchronized universe model. Oh, I'm sorry? It's about to shut off. To shut off? Why is it doing that? Because the saving needs are over there. No, it's not even my computer, so I have no idea. Snooze. Just snooze. Just put snooze. I never left. <laughs> 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 I think the big one. I don't know what the single out was. I don't know what the So one example on um, the kind of dramatic of, 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 of this whole process of direct voice, uh, there was a, uh, a direct voice medium named Valentine who had a small group of uh, a seance people who would come and there was a, a voice that was speaking. Uh, occasion spoken of Chinese, it sounded like Chinese, but no one there spoke Chinese. Um, so after they, they looked around for someone, they found an expert, a language expert, Dr. Uh, Huynet, <coughs> and invited him to come to his next seance, hoping he'd be able to understand the Chinese. Well, he, was, he spoke totally different languages, he was a very uh, talented linguist. And he talks about uh, uh, this medium, you know, a Valentine, and he said that he was a far from polished individual. He'd only been out of England like once or twice, and he didn't, didn't know any other languages. He didn't even seem to understand uh, why people found what he did was interesting. But he did have this gift of direct voice. And so, uh, in the next seance, Wyman is there, and this voice began speaking to him in this ancient dialect in Chinese. And he says, greetings, O son of learning and reader of strange books. This unworthy servant bows humbly before such excellence. And Huai Man recognized the language as that of the Chinese classics, edited by Confucius 2,500 years earlier. It was Chinese as dead as Sanskrit or Latin. It is not spoken colloquially today. Why man thought, if this is a hoax, it is a particularly clever one, far beyond the scope of any of the Chinese experts living today. Uh, and then he began, he, he was really a scholar, but he, he knew some of, the, of Confucius's poems, but he only knew the first line. He didn't know the entire poem. So he began reciting the first line of a particular uh, a verse, and the spirit interrupted him and finished the poem. The voice then explained the errors in copying that had occurred after his death that led to modern confusion. In one case, there was a poem that scholars had puzzled over for hundreds of years and did not understand. The voice took up the poem and recited it to the end, and then put a new construction <coughs> on the verses that made it hang together for the first time. The voice explained it was a psychic poem, which is a recognized type of Chinese literature of the period. For the first time, the book, the poem made complete sense. So, in addition to the 
a wide range of languages, and voice tones, and pitches. Uh, what's interesting is that there could be more than one voice present, or can speak in languages that are very exotic and rare that no one else is liable to know in that room. Uh, so when there were occasions when Wymat uh, said that he was hearing Latvian and uh, a rare um, um, uh, Spanish Basque tone and things like that. Um, so um, it's a very genuine form of spirit communication and the Leslie Flint uh, Trust website has hundreds of recordings from many different spirits, including some who are well known, like um, like um, Gandhi, for example, but others who are just happen to be known to the locals. They're there for the medium. So automatic writing is one more way we have of communicating with the spirits and learning what the afterlife is like. Uh, one example of that uh, was Frederick Bly Bond, who was an architect, uh, given, the, given the, the job of uh, de deciphering where the old Glastonbury Cathedral foundations had been. Uh, and uh, Henry VIII had destroyed that cathedral hundreds of years ago, uh, but he began uh, trying to decipher the foundation plan with a friend of his who uh, was adept at automatic writing. And when he did, then these voices began, messages began coming through in his writing. His name was John Allen Bartlett. And he was getting messages in an old form of Latin. And here's a segment of Capella St. Edgar, Abbas, Beer, Ficket, Han Capellum, St. Edgar. But so it's all Latin, basically, because that's what they spoke in this uh, monastery at the time that the Glastonbury uh, Cathedral was in operation as a monastery. And he, he gives lots of details about the politics that was present at, in the cathedral, in the, in the monastery at the time, and he begins drawing ground plans of the cathedral. So we have lots of details like this, and because of this, uh, Vaughn was able to make very rapid progress. They discovered uh, a lot of things that uh, had been rumored to exist, some chapels that they couldn't find anymore in the modern day, that they located after getting help like this. They also found um, some tombs that were, that were buried around the cathedral. That um, another form of, uh, another famous automatic writer was Chico Xavier, who has a very close connection with Brazilian spiritism. He wrote over 400 books uh, through automatic writing. Uh, he was not well schooled uh, in a conventional sense. He uh, had poor eyesight and uh, in his poor environment, he certainly didn't have access to the internet. This was before internet, by and large. But his books often reflect an enormous uh, scope of knowledge and um, erudition, and they have they, each the book had were, the books were signed by different authors. The author in the spirit world who communicated with him gave his name and he wrote in that style. Um, so uh, over 400 different books as a result. One of the most famous is Nosolar, which uh, tells the experiences of a doctor who died and found himself in the afterlife. Um, he was an atheist, that didn't really matter. <laughs> because the afterlife doesn't really care. <laughs> You're there anyway. And uh, because of things he'd done in his uh, life, way, the way he had lived, he was in the lowest level initially, which we might call hell, but no one is trapped there forever. That's the difference between the, sort of the Protestant or the Christian religious description and the fact that there are these seven levels in the astral plane. And the lowest one has people in it who are there because their vibrations have anger or selfishness or something else that's caused them to find themselves in that plane initially. And when you're there with everybody else who is of that vibration, it's not very pleasant. But, but, but you can get out, and that's really the important thing. Um, and uh, this is a, a wonderful movie called uh, 
astral city about Nassau Wars, the dramatization of, uh, of this book. And this is just what, what he describes this lower realm, is the figures that are wandering uh, in, in semi-darkness and coldness. And not very pleasant at all, not very nice. They were calling him a suicide. He didn't understand that. He was a doctor, he hadn't killed himself. But in fact, through neglect of the way he ate, uh, not taking care of himself properly, he had died early. And from that point of view, he was a suicide. Uh, eventually, he began praying, even though he didn't believe in prayer, but you get desperate enough and you start to pray. Um, and um, these uh, angels of light, but they were just little workers in this dimension, uh, in Masolar, who came to rescue him. And we can have a hot and carried him away into this next level. Uh, in, in the picture of him entering this next level of this region that was sort of built. And I say built, when you, when you build things in the afterlife, you do it with your mind, with your intention, your consciousness. But they built this uh, city, which is sort of for, it's a way station to help people to adjust, to heal, and to prepare for some better dimensions to come. And um, the buildings are often depicted as being quite beautiful. Here the doctor is, Dr. Andre. He's a medical doctor, but the medicine he knows is not like the medicine they are using. They're using what we would call energy medicine. This young doctor is using something like Reiki, sending energy to heal his abdomen in his spirit form. Now, of course, his physical body is buried somewhere else, so this is his, his spirit body. But this is what I was saying before, that when we are, are in these other dimensions, uh, we do often appear to have physical bodies so that there is this form that we carry with us that reflects uh, some of the, our physical characteristics. So this doctor is healing him and eventually he kind of starts to get the lay of the land and understand that the rules uh, in the afterlife are somewhat different than he was expecting. It's not a normal hospital where he kind of thought he would be immediately put in charge with his <laughs> medical background, but he found that they didn't have much respect for his abilities. Yeah. Uh, this is another snapshot, an uh, image of, of one of the areas. The way he describes it, um, this region has a lot of organization to it. And that's one of the most interesting things about the afterlife, that there are buildings, and there are cities, and there are uh, various uh, there are libraries, and there are parks, and all kinds of things that you and I would like, like and expect to see um, based on our normal uh, physical earth-like and, and that's what you find over there because they, they also enjoy these things and they create them. Um, here's an overhead shot of one of the major buildings and it's an organization, a central building that plays a role. Here's a, a park with water and Here's a, a, a building where some, some organization and some communication is going on, some work, as we might call it, uh, music. It's fascinating to, to read about the description. Many different mediums, among the two that I cited earlier, talk about what life is like in the afterlife. And they describe what it's like to go to a concert there. And the difference is that music is coupled with color and uh, so you get the visuals as well as the sound. Uh, also what you discover is in the afterlife that a lot of the creations that artists and scientists and anybody who's creative uh, creates here on the physical often comes from a communication with the spirits and the beings on these higher planes. Over there they have no uh, no dietary requirements, they don't have to eat, they don't get hungry. Um, they have lots of time, they can create the things they love to create. So there are laboratories where science goes on, uh, laboratories where music is created, etc. And um, oftentimes a musician on the earth will wake up in the morning with some melody in his head. He won't know where it came from. It's been downloaded during the night. Okay, inspiration 
often comes from these higher planes. Uh, and when, um, in some of the books where the spirits wander and talk about their experiences in the afterlife, uh, there are art museums where they will see a painting. And it's just like a painting that maybe is hanging in the Louvre, except it's more beautiful and more alive than anything that anyone's ever seen here on Earth. It's the original. You know, and what we have down here are the copies. Um, and, and what some of the scientists say is that they have technology that could leap us hundreds of years ahead. And they'd love to give it to us, but we would misuse it right now. We're not ready spiritually or you know, in terms of maturity to use it properly, but they're ready to do it. And so that's one of the things we have to look forward to as we advance, it's going through these shifts that we are, that are to come, I think, pretty close, um, that these things are ready to, to shower upon us when we're ready to receive them. Um, how are we doing on time? Am I going to learn? How am I doing? I have no idea. And are we supposed to close up at nine, or what's the story? Yeah. No. Is that a yes? Okay. I'm going to talk fast. Then. <laughs> Uh, reincarnation, many of the great uh, famous figures of our world have been big believers in reincarnation. Here's Henry Ford, genius's experience. Some seem to think it's a gift or a talent, but it is the fruit of long experience in many lives. Some are older souls than others, so they know more. And the work is futile if we cannot utilize the experience we collect in one life into the next. And, uh, this has been a Thomas Edison. Many, many people believe this, and I think this plays a role in our world. Uh, I'm going to skip forward here. EVP, electronic voice phenomena. Uh, this is a, a way of communicating directly with spirits without using a medium, but with electrons tend to speak more often in high pitched frequencies that are up 15 kilohertz or higher. Um, so that a lot of the early recordings didn't show anything at first, but if they go back with better technology, they were able to get very good recordings. And it kind of goes back to that experiment I mentioned with um, Sylvia Brown and the little orb speaking in her ear with a high pitch, because these orbs are often the source, <coughs> the source of these uh, sounds, and they tend to speak in a high pitched voice. Um, other technology has led to um, photographs and images being recorded, uh, in Europe, so the spirits themselves in some of these communications, well, from what they say, they are also developing better technology to interface with our computers and, and recordings. Uh, George Meek developed the technology with Bill O'Neill, uh, tried to use uh, high, very high frequency um, up above the gigahertz range, uh, the, the radar range, to get better communication with the higher level spirits. And uh, here is, he began getting some success, and here are some uh, uh, transcripts of some of the conversations. He made contact with a spirit named George Mueller, who was a PhD physicist who died in May of 1967. Then on April 16, 1980, he came through and recorded conversation with O'Neill. Here's Mueller. William, I think the big problem is an impedance mismatch in that third that third transistor. <laughs> O'Neill, the, 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 the human engineer. Third transistor? Mueller, yes, the transistor that follows the input. O'Neill, I don't understand. Mueller, impatiently. The preamp, the preamp. <laughs> O'Neill, oh, the preamp. Mueller, yes, I think that I can easily correct that by introducing a 150 or 100 ohm. I'm not sure whether 150 ohm, one half watt resistor in parallel with a point oh oh four seven microfarad. Sorry, <laughs> so this is from the spirit. Okay, so he's clearly completely conscious. Okay, O'Neill. Oh boy, I have to get back that to the schematic. Mueller, you really have a schematic? O'Neill, I'm not a rocket on the schematic doctor. <laughs> uh, so we have lots of examples like that that show that. These spirits that are in full command of their consciousness uh, in the afterlife. Uh, reincarnation, one more way we have evidence. Uh, President Stevenson, uh, the, 
the dean of this subject in examining thousands of cases of children who remembered uh, things about their previous life with such detail that it attracted their parents' attention. They often reported it. Uh, Stevenson would go in and analyze what they said. He could find the village and the family where they had lived before and relate them and we have to meet their previous family, things like that. Um, and it's just a little story. I, when my first book of Bonds and Books came, it came to my, my parents' house in Bretton, Virginia, a small southern Virginia town. It was delivered by Jimmy Hunt, who was a deacon in our church. He's also the local UPS delivery man. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he, he said to me, he looked at the label on the box and said, he thought it said poison, but it was really just Poseidia was the name of my company. And he asked me what it was about. And I said it was a book I'd written about the paranormal. And I was kind of worried because in Gretna, most people are, you know, pretty conventional uh, Christians. And I was afraid that maybe he would take this with evil, <clears throat> you know, how he would react. But when I said it was the paranormal, he said, oh, is that kind of like past life regression? <laughs> and then he explained that the minister of my family's church, the man who I actually heard preach once or twice, had conducted dozens of past life regressions on people in the town. And more than that, he had regressed his wife, who had gone back into a past life in Germany, in the 1800s, where she spoke through in German. And that also spoke. And she never had any electrical training at all in this lifetime. It was a famous case that the incidents had been investigated for, for five years. And so on. it was just remarkable to hear that it's, it's called xenoglossy, this ability to speak a language that you've never been exposed to in this lifetime. And it's a very strong proof that uh, the afterlife is real. So the book is called Wretched I Am that they wrote about that. But um, it's just a kind of amazing image of looking into these cases, how much evidence there is uh, that these things are real. So summary, many planes in the afterlife. At death, we go to the one that resonates with our present level of development. As we advance, our consciousness takes on higher frequencies. We resonate with higher planes. The more planes are more visible. And the organization chart looks kind of like this. We enter on the Earth plane. And the higher levels are above this. And uh, let me move quickly. I know we're almost out of time here, but one of the other subtopics of my book is the shift. Because when I got all this research done, uh, hundreds and hundreds of books, I began coming across this idea that we are on the verge of a consciousness shift here on the planet Earth. And I've heard uh, the interviews with uh, Corey Good and David Wilcox about this shift. And that was interesting, but I wasn't sure if that was the whole story. And then I noticed that a lot of the other people who had talked about the afterlife had also described the same shift. Uh, if you look at physical evidence, the Earth's magnetic field has been weakening dramatically over the last couple hundred years. Uh, the number of volcanoes Earth worldwide has been increasing steadily over the same time period. The pole, the pole, has been moving very erratically the last 20 or 30 years. Its speed has increased dramatically by about a factor of four or five over the last 50 years. So something is happening, something's changing. Um, I know that Andrew Casey had predicted a pole shift and talked about a new root race uh, during his prophecies. And I've been very interested in that stuff and kind of watching for it. But I couldn't believe that maybe something was actually happening. Um, it turns out that there is something called the Yuga cycle, a 24,000 year cycle that we go through that connects dark ages with golden ages. And we've just left the end of the last dark age. We're now ascending the Dwapara Yuga into a more enlightened period. And uh, Sri Yukteswar, who was the teacher of Yogananda uh, wrote about this, the book called The Holy Science, and uh, he was able to predict 
what the next discoveries our science would, would make based upon this light bulb. And he knew that our understanding of atomic physics, quantum physics, things like that, would be increasing very rapidly during the first half of the last century. So it is a very important time we're in now. I think we're speeding up and we're entering a time of much greater understanding. When I look at all these different pieces of the puzzle, I put, I put together this picture um, because this the future cycle lasts 24,000 years, and you can explain that if our solar system is going to an orbit over around something distant, around 24,000 year cycle. And if we're passing through a special region of space that causes things to be different, that will help us to account for why things would change in a cyclic way. Uh, and what I propose in this special region of space is that it involves left-handed torsion, or what we call dark matter. That would cause an increase in ESP and other aspects of consciousness uh, increase. Uh, we know, for example, there's a region in the sky uh, called the uh, strange attractor in Virgo. And when that region is over our heads, our ESP is several times higher than it is during the rest of the day. So that's the best time to do remote viewing, the best time to be an ESP receiver. So left-handed torsion is connected to ESP. And the scientists have done experiments that verify that. Um, the other thing we know is that there have been advanced technologies, advanced societies in the past. So these golden ages that the human cycle predicts, uh, we have evidence that they existed in the past. This is the Baalbek uh, Temple in Lebanon. These huge stones, we have no idea how to move these things today. And yet, at some point in time, somebody did. Uh, in Giza, the, the, the Nineveh constant involves the orbits of every planet in our solar system multiplied together. It's something that we've only recently been able to even verify. It's a, it was found in clay tablets in Nineveh, in the archaeological ruins. Uh, we have nuclear radioactive sites in Western India, Harappa culture, that show that in the distant past, there was a very advanced technology on our planet that we've lost sight of, we've forgotten, but it existed at one time. So this is verification of the Yuga cycles that they're real. Um, Michael Blickman, who's a well-known crop circle researcher, says this about it. We're talking about a staggering moment in human history. There's no doubt in the next 10 years, we're going to have direct communication with our cousins. We're not and we're not going to be prepared for this cataclysm until a critical mass of humanity has moved comfortably into the coming fifth dimension. Um, UFO contactees like Sherry Wilde says it's an absolute truth that the Earth will be moving into the higher vibration. And those unable to survive that shift because of their lower frequency will be taken to a new place to continue their growth at their own pace without interfering with the Earth's evolution or their fellow human beings, their, their right to live in peace. Another UFO abductee says, I also receive information on the raising of human consciousness and of a dimensional shift that is presently happening on Earth. It's going to assist us and enable us to access other realms more freely as well as increase our spiritual understanding. Uh, Sal Rochelle, who is a clairvoyant, says Earth is becoming a fourth density planet. This is exactly as you know if you listen to the, the Corey Gooder and Nick Wilcox interviews, that this is what they're saying. From a very different direction, but the same information implies those souls vibrating at fourth density and above will be allowed to incarnate on the Earth from this point forward. Those souls who desire to live in true peace and prosperity will remain on the Earth. Um, Bruce Mullen, who goes out of body frequently, uh, trained at the Monroe Institute, um, says that he made contact with a group of ETs while out of body. And they were in a massive craft, and they told him, we've come to this region to witness events taking place on the Earth, specifically the great event that is happening here to the Earth School. 
It's our understanding that one of the potential results of the Earth changes, as you call it, is that the Earth will be joining our Federation. And I'm excited about that. <laughs> uh, another person, Rosalind McKnight, who is a researcher who wrote about it in Monroe, going out of body, says the next hundred years from 1970 is an intense energy period in the growth of the planet. The highest and lowest migratory souls will be back on the Earth at the same time. There will be changes in the physical Earth structure that will represent shifts in the consciousness of the Earth level. The Earth is moving into a higher level from more gross energies. And Corey Good says, now Gaia is going through an ascension. It is finishing its last transitions in the fourth density. And we're kind of like fleas on a dog. A dog that's going through ascension. And we happen to be on the dog. We're riding a planet, and we're riding the wave of ascension, or the wake, I guess you could say, of ascension that our planet's going through. Um, and James Gillard also talks about this very often. I know we're getting short in time here. But basically, when we go through, once a person is lifted into a higher state of consciousness, he or she cannot afford to continue old habits and must discipline his or herself from expressing the lower vibrational attitudes and emotions, such as fear, anger, jealousy. Self-discipline and self-authority are imperative. So we kind of, there's a lot of people here who've talked about this. Uh, you know, they hot water, this is the new root range, new kids are being born on this planet, much more advanced than we've had before. There's a pivotal shift now in what we are as human beings. The success or failure of human ensoulment is said to occur at this level of evolutionary growth. These kids act as if they've never been on this or any other planet before, says that water. Uh, they consider the human body, anybody, useless, a clumsy appendage. They appear to be utterly unconcerned with family issues and personal relationships. And, and just uh, to, to close this part out, What's been happening in space is very intriguing and it's connected to this. Um, by reading Casey, I was expecting this shift to occur in the year 2000. The sun goes through a powerful solar flare there, powerful solar flares. I thought it might cause a shift in the poles at that time. But what happened is that these huge craft began coming into our solar system then. And uh, Corey Good talks about this and some of this. Uh, interviews, but these were photographed by this by the NASA SOHO uh, satellite that looks at the sun. And some of these, these objects that would show up in their photography don't belong there. They were the size of planets, they were relatively near the sun, they were much too big to be anything art artificial, artifactual, and yet they would appear for hours and then disappear. They could move very quickly. So, they began watching these things, which were uh, something we we'll call them sun cruisers. They would blink in and blink out in relatively short time periods. It was a suggestion that some powerful technology was interacting with our sun. And I wondered at, the sun, at that time, because I thought the sun was on the verge of exploding the coronal mass ejection and causing a cold shift then. And nothing happened. And I kind of wondered, gee, you know, is somebody helping us? You know, is this technology that's doing something? Um, and that's what Corey Good has been saying. Um, and then recently, we've been seeing photographs of the sun like this, which kind of removed all doubt to me. Um, this is a, the edge of the sun here. And this is some very strange analogy here that is interacting with the sun. It's pulling some kind of energy off the sun, I think. And the blow up of that picture looks like this. It's like the sun is being toyed with and being interfered with. It. Being, I, I'm guessing it's taking away electricity from the solar atmosphere. But um, and we had that recent shutdown, the very mysterious shutdown of the telescope uh, in Sunspot in Mexico. And that same week, a lady, uh, I think she's in Indiana, uh, Gina Maria Coleman Hill, took this photograph from the back backyard telescope she had. And this is, here's the sun. And she was seeing all these strange objects, including one huge object in the vicinity of the sun. Which again suggests 
that there is a technology, a race of beings perhaps, that are trying to keep our sun toned down, keep it from generating a huge coronal mass ejection until we are ready for it. Uh, because if it happens when the sun is in its most ha active part of its cycle, it can be very damaging to the Earth. If it happens when the sun is in a more quiet period, it may be more gentle and we can survive it much better. Um, if you assume that these events are being caused by that kind of torsion, which is my guess, then it will have effects like this on the Earth uh, when it occurs. These are some events that have been predicted by people like Corey Good uh, that will, it will affect um, physical material objects like airplanes, electric volcanoes, magnetic fields, etc. Um, so we'd like it to be more gentle, not in the worst possible case. Uh, if you look at what that might imply for when it would happen, this is the sunspot number, the solar cycle. They reached peaks here in 2000 about 2014, so the last couple of cycles have been kind of weird. They've been getting weaker and kind of later than they should. And this might be because of the interference that we just saw in those pictures. Uh, if this is true, if, and if there is somebody trying to help us by keeping the sun toned down, then that would mean that this event will occur in a minimum region. This cloud of left-handed kind of torsion that comes through that triggers this event might occur in this for a low activity period of the sun. So that's kind of my guess as when it might occur. Um, and if it does, and if these prophecies are right, then what they're kind of saying is that the Earth now might split the two different, different Earths. You know, maybe a fourth dimensional Earth that's the more advanced Earth for we get to stay there for high enough vibration, and another planet for those of lower vibration third density. Uh, and this little quote here from a Dolores Cannon uh, regression uh, seems to be connected. Uh, John says, this is all going to be changing very shortly because the Earth is going to be too highly evolved for these spirits. So we're going to be shipping these souls out. John laughed suddenly. You know, it's, so, it's like, okay, you had your chance here. Next boat is going to Arcturus, humorously. Yep, you had your chances here. So now I have to ship you out to those other planets that are over there near Arcturus. Yes, he says, those are still evolving planets, but these higher vibrational spirits won't come back here because this planet, Earth, is changing. And I'm not sure this, if she transliterated Arcturus into Arcturus or not, but it might be the same place. Uh, but anyway, it's kind of intriguing, and it's a possible way that things might be unfolding. So, um, I've got my theory, but I still kind of like uh, thinking that. Uh, Are we okay? Yeah, yeah please. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Bring out the hook and sign. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I'll do a little bit of theory, just to kind of get the theory out. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.
with club power. So it explains how people are able to communicate psychically, how healers are able to work on somebody thousands of miles away, how you can affect objects at great distance if you use torsion and combine it with um, the rest of science. Um, this is what I like about Einstein, the, the emphasis on the thought experiment, that your intuition is a great guide in understanding scientific processes. So that the real idea of the model is that every little particle moving is able to communicate with distant particles, very, very far away. So here's a local particle. Here's the particles in the distant matter of space, billions of miles, billions of light years away, really. If, if a particle here, when it zigs and zags, creates a little radiation that's very, very narrow, it can interact with something far away and still have a significant interaction. So that's part of the model. The other part of the model, then, is that these particles, they travel so close to the speed of light, they read the radiation is focused in a very tight cone. So they interact only with something that's very narrow. Uh, they can be very, very distance away. And this will occur if their motions are synchronized. So this little guy is pointing it this way, and the zinc is to the left, and this guy is focused this way, and this way. Then you can get a focus, you know, wave. It's very narrow, but at the right moment, it'll connect the two objects and allow them to interact. So this kind of explains how it's possible to have long-range interactions uh, in this synchronized universe model. And uh, that'll lead you very naturally to the idea that our universe, as they say, synchronized particles, is like one sheet and a stack of paper. And many other universes are like other sheets in a stack of paper with different synchronizations, different frequencies. And they see particles in their plane, but not in our plane. Our plane, our particles see themselves but not the other plane. So we have many realities that are all occurring at the same time, but that we are unaware of each other. Um, and the whole idea is sort of like a fan that's spinning. You have a strobe light, and you strobe your light so it matches the frequency of the turning of the blades, just the right speed, then the blades will appear to be frozen stationary. But if you change the frequency, the blades disappear. So it's all about synchronization. And that allows you to have many realities that are all existing in the same place, even though very different things appear to be happening to them. It also explains how therapy healers and other types of miracles, where people can reach their hands to matter. You just shift the things, and the force that was there before goes away. Um, it also opens up the possibility that you can have objects that cross many planes of reality. These are higher dimensional objects. Um, in my book, I have a picture from Jack Stuckey, who many of you may know, uh, who took a, mod took a picture of an object that showed up, began communicating with him. They explained to him that it was a higher dimensional object. It would be seen by us as a fractal. And he asked if he could, could take a picture. He took a photograph of it, and it looks kind of like a fern. It's very strange, like a white fern in his living room that is this higher dimensional being because it's crossing many different planes of frequency at the same time so you don't see all of it at any given moment. So uh, consciousness comes into this whole process as well because not only do particles have to be synchronized with each other, they have to be synchronized with the observer. And the observer has to be synchronized too. So uh, the particles that make up our brain and our body, they have frequencies. They have to be synchronized, and so they become part of the consciousness that is observing the reality. So we'll see a certain plane that we're resonant with. We won't see other planes. We can, if we become very skillful at controlling how our resonance and our frequency works, we can interact with other things and shift their frequencies so we can make it change from here to here. So this is an essence of, of PK, of psychokinesis, how we can affect physical phenomena. So here are some cl cl clues or cues uh, from Doris Cannon and Corey Good on how to get through the shift. Raise your vibration, eating lighter, fruits and vegetables, meditate more, focus on raising your vibration, release karma, <coughs> release the old baggage, forgive, forgive yourself, forgive everyone. Don't give it to you. Think for yourself. Don't listen to the messages of the mass media. 
Remember that we as souls are immortal and indestructible. We need to learn. Life is an illusion. It's a play. The only thing real is love. This is an exciting time of transition and growth. Let us add our light and love to the planet as we experience a graduation into a new era. And then very, very quickly, you know, if, if, that, if that kind of torsion is the key to this cloud and this new energy, then here's what it does to matter. It changes the way particles behave. It changes how they move. So here's time in the vertical direction. With cool left-handed torsion, it tends to push the particle backwards in time more often. It knocked backwards in time, and that will cause their motion to change. So before, maybe the particle had a very simple motion, a little self orbit like this. With the more left-handed torsion, it takes on more horizontals, takes on a more complex pattern, and even more left-handed torsion, more and more worlds, and this will give them higher density, which is what the ETs are calling it, uh, in, in higher frequencies, so we can make contact with higher planes of consciousness. Now here's what can happen when you begin being successful at raising your vibration, so you go above the normal vibrational frequency of most of us around. This is the 16th Karmapa uh, in deep meditation, and he's able to change his frequency sufficiently that he becomes invisible. He's still sitting right here. Okay. And this was photographed by uh, a fellow who was right there at the time, and other people were watching, and he becomes invisible uh, by shifting his frequency significantly. Um, so these are some examples of what you can begin to understand with this model. Uh, you start to realize that the, the universe is filled with these uh, strings of torsion, these interactions of particles that are very far apart, and yet they still see each other, and they still interact with each other. And these structures can be quite permanent. So the universe, viewed from this perspective, might look more like this. Instead of empty space, it's all these little torsion strings, and little regions where there's clusters that come together interacting, and these are more like centers of consciousness, more like souls, but, but they're connected instantaneously all across the universe. And when uh, a, a yogi uh, merges with God, this entire thing, you might think it was God. It's the universe, it's all there is, in a very simplified way, obviously. But, um, and if you can connect with this, and you're connected with everything that's known in the universe. Because every little particle here is involved, every interaction, every thought, every event, it's all connected in this web, this massive web that permeates the universe and carries information instantly anywhere within it. Um, and so this might be sort of a model for what they call non dual consciousness, where our separation from the universe has blurred out and disappeared and we now merge uh, with this massive intelligence that is the entire universe. Um, you can start to understand this if you look at models for uh, neural networks, computer models. If you put together enough nodes, which those are uh, black circles for are in the picture, those nodes become logic centers. And you can start to understand that this neural network could be conscious. So. Um, this whole picture, these are just pieces of the puzzle. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, I think my, my, the bottom line is I'm thinking that if you look at our physics today, 10 to the minus 15 meters with a proton, it's kind of the smallest we can really try to kind of explain. But there are much shorter distances down to the planet plane there. And that's probably where the astral, the mental, the cause, and the buddhic, and the higher dimensions of the afterlife can be found. And that's probably where the new physics will be as we start to include consciousness uh, as one new aspect. We have to integrate with our existing physics. So um, that pretty much concludes my talk for today. Bob Monroe is right. We're more than our physical bodies. Through prayer, meditation, and visualization, we can create the world we want. And as Victor Hugo said, all of the armies of the world are not as powerful as an idea whose time has come. So, we thank you very much.